There really isn't anyone in the gaming canon quite like Bayonetta, sporting an instantly iconic air of style, confidence, and an unrelenting aversion to subtlety. Platinum Games' delightful Umbra Witch bursts into the room, exquisitely rips the place to shreds, and then dashes away with a kiss. Or, you know, bullets. Her boisterous personality extends into the gameplay, an explosive ballet of guns, weapons, and infernal appendages, joyfully deployed among flashing lights and blooming roses. Yet in the years since her debut, Bayonetta has remained a polarizing figure, owing her notoriety to her prominent sex appeal. Bayonetta's character is tied deeply to her overt sexuality. Her postures, motions, and vocalizations are all quite suggestive from how she behaves in cutscenes to the way she works levers and gyros. The camera zooms into and over her curves, especially during her climax attacks, which are called climax attacks, in case you were unaware of how sexual Bayonetta was. Scenes like this, this, and this, felt gratuitous and led a noteworthy contingent of critics and players to ask whether Bayonetta is saucy fun or pandering exploitation. Was she another example of the limited role women are allowed to play in entertainment? Now look, I know what I'm starting by asking this. Half of my listeners are upset about my feminist agenda, and the other half don't want their feminism to come from a straight cis guy who thinks he can judge a woman's acceptability. I get it. But I feel like the elevated emotions around even a mention of sexualization has eclipsed any deeper analysis of this character, be it praise, condemnation, or just indifference. The backlash, and the backlash to the backlash, has died down since the last game's release, but I'd be astonished if the newly announced Bayonetta 3 didn't bring this conversation back to 2014 levels of anger. I want to get ahead of the outrage to make a coherent case for Bayonetta, because I think she epitomizes the vibrancy of womanhood. Her sexuality is an extension of a well-rounded identity and a finger to those who despise her bombast. Bayonetta is a comprehensively phenomenal character, but the oxygen spent on debating her sexiness has occluded this realization. Her design was credited to artist Mari Shimazaki, who worked alongside director Hideke Kamiya to create their ideal version of a modern witch. Miss Shimako had considerable creative autonomy on the project, and as a result, imbued Bayonetta with many subtle but important flourishes. For a character who's been derided as a cheap object of male affection, she doesn't resemble the kinds of women who often appear in the Japanese media specifically designed for sexual gratification. If you've seen a certain type of D-tier anime or lusty video game, then you know what I'm describing. Heaving, bouncy, and impossibly perky breasts strapped down by minimal or skin-tight clothing, ample butts bolted onto otherwise slim, girlish bodies exposed through copious upskirt panty shots, and an almost virginal ignorance to her own sexuality despite a constant, anxious obsession with it. That last point is key, since autonomy can make all the difference between fun and exploitation. Now, I have no preoccupying qualms with big titties, but when so many fictional women only look like this, then those who deviate are accused of being anti-feminine. It's a problem that so much media endorses a narrow and fictionalized version of women designed for the pleasure of the aforementioned cis-straight guys. Bayonetta, by contrast, at least looks like an action heroine. Her body is fit for action rather than cuddles. One user even called her a transphobic slur because apparently Bayonetta didn't look feminine enough. Case in point, many pornographic illustrators choose to inflate Bayonetta's breasts and butt, I guess because Bayonetta as is isn't sexy enough to crank it to. At the same time, the parts of her body that have been enhanced for sex appeal go beyond the areas of male attention. The length and dexterity of her legs, the opening in the back of her bodysuit, and the creativity of her fashion. That's the kind of stuff women tend to like about other women. 
Miss Shimazaki focused intensely on Bayonetta's style, going the extra mile to characterize her through lavish attire. Fringes and drapes adorn the cape sleeves of her black outfit, shimmering with gold accents that hold down her opera-length silk gloves. The pointy hat commonly associated with witches was replaced with a beehive rapdu, stacking more lovingly crafted elegance atop an already sharp ensemble. Then there are the accent pieces placed over her chest, as if to say, I know where the people are looking, so that's where I choose to show my style. And honestly, who could forget the gun heels? The guns on her heels. Like, that's just awesome. The frills add such joyfulness to her combat, little nuances that make her stand out from other sexy action heroines, both aesthetically and mechanically. The white gloves and gold trim were important for visual clarity, allowing players to easily track the black-clad bayonetta during combat. These distinctly feminine tastes and sensibilities were incredibly important to the overall product. While director Kamiya ultimately wanted a pretty witch dressed in black, it was Miss Shimazaki's meticulous ornamentation and trained eye on the feminine form that elevated Bayonetta to icon status. Three times. To quote Miss Shimazaki herself, I think I was able to put my feelings into her design, and she ended up a strong female character. So, if the testimonial from the artist or the reaction from my wife is anything to go by, then it's safe to say that Bayonetta flaunts the parts of womanhood that go beyond the male gaze to instead occupy the feminine fascinations of women themselves. But if you need more evidence of the queerness in Bayonetta, then there was that time she teamed up with her girlfriend to punch God into the sun. Of course, video games are more than just static images on a page. They're an animated and interactive medium that relies on motion, camera placement, and player input to communicate. Characters, too, are more than just looks. Their thoughts, personalities, and motivations belie their actions and mannerisms. It's possible for the framing of the protagonist to undermine the overall quality of the character by presenting them in a way that diminishes their power. The camera loves to stare at Bayonetta. It follows her closely, soaring over the curves of her bodies and catching glimpses of her sexy bits while she's dashing across the screen. But here's the kicker. Bayonetta loves to strike a pose. Literally loves to show off for pictures while walking around, during combat, and whenever she's feeling especially good about herself. She's incredibly aware of her relationship to the camera, and so she takes every opportunity to bewitch the presumed audience. I say bewitch on purpose because that's how Platinum Games designers describe Maiko Uchida, the real-life inspiration for Bayonetta's movement. All the captivating and well-articulated motions that characterize her at her most fabulous came from this incredibly talented performer, the stunning muse for a team of men largely inexperienced with dance. Like with Mari Shimazaki's astute design intuition, it's astounding how many of Bayonetta's greatest features represent the ideas, talents, and expressions of awesome women showing off their skills. As a result, Bayonetta plays this high-caliber charisma straight to the camera, winking and gesturing to the viewer, dancing suggestively atop the fourth wall, but never slowing down as a result. She never treats the presumed audience as a hindrance or source of embarrassment, she spins and stretches her body while daring the onlookers to keep up. Hell, she even slows down time, lest we lose track of her entirely. It's this extra layer of narrative context that makes Bayonetta such an empowering character to play as. She enjoys openly displaying how good she looks and gets a rush from putting on a show. So while the frame may leer excessively on Bayonetta's butt from time to time, pushing the boundaries of good taste, she autonomously expresses her sexuality. In stark contrast to characters like 2B, Juliet Starling, Harley Quinn, Quiet, Marion, and Ashley Graham, whose sexualization constitutes an invasion of privacy or a compromised state in which they can't control what's happening to them. I would call their treatment exploitative, more so than a woman who permits a little peeking on her terms. I'm also confident in Bayonetta's agency because of her narrative relationship to the man behind the camera, Luca the journalist. 
Luca is a skilled, if bumbling, investigative reporter researching the influence of Paradiso and Inferno on Earth. He's also hilariously in love with Bayonetta, like desperately enamored with her. So while he follows her to learn more about the celestial interlopers that killed his father, his obsession with the Umber Witch runs deeper than professional obligation. Bayonetta sees Luca's determination and just mocks him for it. Like, someone rendered so easily tongue-tied and flustered by her appearance isn't someone she needs to take seriously. By contrast, Rodan, Enzo, and Loki can work with her without needing a napkin to blot up their slobber. It's an important detail in the writing, showing how Bayonetta prefers the company of men who remain composed around her. She wants to stay true to her wild self, and isn't impressed when people can't handle that. It's only when Luca approaches her with care and intelligence that she stops humiliating him. Mostly. I look dreadful, do I? Huh? You'll have to learn to wipe that stupid look off your face, or I'll never let you keep chasing me around this world. Got that? Luca? <laughs> Now that's more like it. Even beyond her interactions with the rest of the cast, Bayonetta's sexuality and womanhood is further explored by her incredible story. Yes, you heard me correctly. The Bayonetta games have richly detailed and emotionally dense stories. I know that must come as a surprise, since even Bayonetta's defenders argue that the over-the-top style and sexual allure precludes any deeper analysis of its vast and surely nonsensical plot. Those people should be put in timeout so they can think about what they've done. If there's two things I hate in this world, it's cockroaches and crying babies. Don't get me wrong, it's a high concept narrative that's frustratingly told, but the overcomplicated lore and setup belie a core of humanity. When I finally understood what was going on, I found a boldly inspiring tale of a woman toppling a patriarchal system while healing from the harm of a deeply sexist culture. So here, I'll try to explain this as simply as possible. God help me. The Lumen Sage. Bayonetta is a distinctly Japanese take on Christian imagery and the politics of medieval Europe. Paradiso and Inferno enforce a strict separation to maintain a balance in the celestial powers. The Lumen Sages of Paradiso and the Umber Witches of Inferno are the humans who keep the balance on Earth. The stalemate is broken when a Lumen Sage named Baldur and an Umbra Witch named Rosa fall in love and conceive a child, a witch named Cereza. For this transgression, Paradiso begins the witch hunts to exterminate the Umbra Witches, lest their temptations corrupt the balance any further. And much like the witch hunts of European history, the forces claiming to represent the will of heaven are less interested in moral philosophy than they are in obedience, particularly of women. Their doctrine demands intense social compliance, and Bayonetta perfectly captures how misogynistic that standard is. The masculine Lumen Sage must deny his true feelings through impossible levels of discipline, while the free and feminine Umber Witches are scorned for the crime of being loved by men. Baldur and Rose's union was seen as the witches causing disorder, rather than a man and a woman falling in love. Despite the witches' attempts to hide Cereza's lineage, Paradiso still viewed them as dangerous to the trinity of realities, an unholy problem to be solved with Inquisition. Baldur's responsibility for the truce-breaking child he conceived never entered the conversation. It's as if the truce was really meant to subjugate the witches, more so than enforce an abstract sense of balance. Centuries later and racked with maladaptive grief, Baldur seeks to finish what the Lumen Sages started, kill the last witch, seize the eyes of the world, and use them to summon the primeval creator, Jubileus, to remake the trinity of realities. He pulls little Cereza through time and into the future, requiring her innocence to complete the ritual. Except now he must contend with Bayonetta, who refuses to let another girl be manipulated and traumatized by his desires. I know Bayonetta doesn't seem like a game about trauma, unless you count the blunt force kind, but Please, hear me out. The demands of celestial balance ripped her from her parents and left her orphaned as punishment for their relationship. Then, just as she became a woman, she had to watch a genocide unfold, as a repressive and misogynistic culture destroyed everything she cared about. It's from this upbringing where we can see why Bayonetta is the way she is. She owns her bombastic self and shines in the face of those who resent her. 
The beauty and sexuality that made her a target are now the pieces of herself that empower her the most. So when she sees another little girl being bullied by angels, she pulls that child out of danger and teaches her how to be tough, how to hold her head high with the pride and power ladies are capable of. Bayonetta doesn't want Cereza to suffer in a culture that's terrified of what she'll become. Without someone to care for her, to see her embrace the vibrancy of girlhood, Cereza may be preyed upon, led astray, or forced to hide her true self. As Bayonetta preserves this little girl's childhood, she also mends the wounds of her own. A woman like Bayonetta keeps her emotions close to the chest, but being there for her younger self is transformative. Maybe protecting a child allowed her to open up for others. Maybe in forging this bond, Bayonetta gave herself the loving family that was taken from her by the hatred of Paradiso. Whatever the reason, this affirming experience granted her the strength and clarity she needed to team up with her girlfriend to punch God right into the sun. Let's dance, boys! Bayonetta burst onto the scene at a time when games were their most insecure about being taken seriously. The high-octane flashes of her shapely bum didn't gel well with then-contemporary trends. Reading poor user reviews at the time, Bayonetta was negatively compared to Fallout 3, God of War, and even Mass Effect 2. Which is hilarious, because the Mass Effect franchise is best remembered for all the space sex that Shepard had with really hot aliens. Now that Bayonetta 3 has been announced, I'm sure the Umber Witch will have a much warmer welcome from the gaming community at large. From the press to the public, the zeitgeist has changed in the last decade. We're a hornier bunch now, and we're proud of it. Loudly fawning over giant ladies, bisexual pirate queens, and other bat-winged dominatrices. Seriously, I doubt the people who fell over themselves to get stepped on by Megara will turn around and find Bayonetta objectionable. Plus, the bar for women's representation has risen. The goal is not to police their actions, but to break down their motivations and make space for a more diverse collection of experiences. With conversation, we can understand sex as more than just pleasure for the audience. It's a window into the character's world, from the joy of physical expression to the catharsis of rising above struggle. Bayonetta's sexuality does all of these things. She exists as she does because it's an existence she fought for because she remembers the women who didn't survive that patriarchal system. Her sexuality is her liberation, and that's truly beautiful. She and her happiness are beyond the will of men. <laughs> 